Hi there, I'm Jason Smithers. I'm a pediatric surgeon here at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital and the director of the EAT program or uh, soft shield and airway treatment uh, program. One of the most common conditions we treat is called tracheomalacia. Tracheomalacia is a condition where you have problems with either the airway shape or the integrity of it, how stiff or how floppy it is that can lead to airway obstruction. This is a problem that can occur in all different ages from newborns uh, even up into adulthood. It can be associated with other conditions. Uh, a, a very common one is esophageal atresia, where babies are born with an esophagus that is not intact. Other conditions commonly seen with tracheomalacia include heart conditions, especially vascular rings. Uh, and interestingly, we'll find it in kids who seemingly don't have any other congenital problems uh, other than a problem with the way the trachea works. Uh, so next we'll start to show some of the anatomic issues we see with tracheomalacia. Tracheomalacia refers to, uh, a lot of people think of it as a floppy airway, and sometimes it's an airway that is too soft and floppy, and sometimes it's an airway that just has an abnormal shape. So if we look at the trachea, uh, this is a trachea that comes down and it branches into a right side and a left side. Those go to the right and left lungs. Uh, at the top of the trachea is the larynx uh, uh, with the vocal cords. When you look down the barrel of the trachea, when, when we do a bronchoscopy, which is the, the most common way to evaluate the trachea, you're like looking down the barrel of it. A normal trachea should have this appearance, which we uh, consider the letter C. And it's like the letter C on its, uh, on its face. This part is more rigid, made of cartilage rings. This part is softer, called the membranous trachea, and it's made out of smooth muscle. Um, with tracheomalacia, you can have different problems with the cartilage shape. So this one we consider a letter U, um, and that has made this membranous part or soft part a little wider. Uh, it can get wider still if you have like the letter D and uh, the worst uh, shape as far as width of the membranous trachea we call like a bow, uh, like as for a bow and arrow. But as you get these different um, cartilage shapes uh, for the airway, the wider this soft part is, the more able it is to protrude inward and sort of obstruct the trachea, especially uh, when you're agitated or breathing heavily or coughing. Um, and so that's, the, that's a very common issue with tracheomalacia and the most common type that we treat. These different issues with the cartilage shape uh, can occur at, at really any point along the airway. And so the, the area of the airway that's involved also has a, a big impact on what options there are to, to treat it. Um, the most common option that, that we use that, that is most, most effective for most types of tracheomalacia is called a posterior tracheopexy. And with that operation, you're taking this soft part uh, of the trachea, the membranous trachea, and we pull it back to the spine uh, and, and sort of pin it there. So if we, um, normally if you have a trachea, the thing that sits right behind it is the esophagus, and right behind that is the, is the anterior front part of the spine. Uh, and this is the vertebral bodies, the support part of the spine, and there's ligaments there. Uh, what we can do for a posterior tracheopexy is just move the esophagus uh, off to the side slightly and then pull this part of the trachea back and suture it to the spine. And that would give this, this trachea like a, a new shape, something like this, where now this part is physically held back and can't uh, protrude inward. Like in this case, this can protrude inward and obstruct the trachea when it does that. But with the posterior tracheopexy, when it's sutured back in place, it can no longer protrude inward like that. Uh, and that's the posterior tracheopexy. 
Other aspects of, of tracheomalacia can involve problems uh, also from the front. Um, in front of the, the trachea, you often have blood vessels. So we can see uh, conditions where you have a trachea sort of say with an abnormal cartilage shape from the front where this is a, a blood vessel. Um, the, the major arteries that come off the aorta in the chest um, uh, can sort of push on the trachea. Uh, sometimes it, the trachea can be pushed on both from the back and the front, so you can have both problems. Uh, so some, some types of tracheomalacia involve moving the blood vessels away from the trachea, and also sometimes putting sutures in the front part of the trachea uh, to pull that cartilage shape uh, towards the front to improve uh, flattening that occurs from the front side. At the end of the day, for each type of trache tracheomalacia, for each patient, you have to customize a solution that works for their particular anatomy. Um, and that can involve different parts of the trachea, moving it towards the back or towards the front uh, in order to open that up and prevent that collapse. So uh, over the past decade, as we've sort of learned uh, a lot more details about tracheomalacia and um, we've essentially come to, to learn it in a almost like a whole new light. Um, prior to the development of our um, esophageal and airway program in Boston that I was uh, a part of from the beginning, the, the treatments for tracheomalacia weren't very well understood and not many people did them. And as we learned better ways to treat tracheomalacia, we, we suddenly that became a huge source of referrals. Um, and literally where you may have done cases like that once or twice every five years, we're all of a sudden doing it three or four times a week. Uh, and this is because patients were coming from around the country in different places because solutions and the understanding of tracheomalacia just wasn't, wasn't well known. And, and uh, the surgeons or, or airway teams, they didn't know what to offer. So we, you'd have a lot of families who didn't know where to go or had nowhere else to go. And, but once we were finding really great outcomes, um, with treatment that, that quickly spread around uh, that that there's a place with a lot of experience with this and that is actually having really good good outcomes. Um, we were able to bring that down to the program uh, here in St. Petersburg as well and uh, in a similar way we're now to a point where we treat patients uh, like this two or three times every week. So what we are able to do and, and sort of build a whole team where we now have multiple surgeons um, who, who work on the team really dedicated to this, uh, pulmonologists, uh, GI doctors, ENT doctors who uh, are gaining a lot more experience with just with high patient volume. And, uh, and we're finding that these kids can have great outcomes, especially with teams that are expert on it and see it sort of day in and day out. It goes for anesthesia staff, nursing staff, really the whole, uh, the whole gambit. <laughs>